Welcome as we study the readings for this coming Sunday. We'll start our study with a gospel reading from the book of John, followed by the first reading from the book of Ezekiel, and then study the second reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that as we come closer to the celebration of your resurrection, that the studies that we have are so meaningful for us as we learn to uh, understand just what your coming into the world means to the world, what your coming to the world means to us, to each one of us, as we look forward and anticipate that celebration. Thank you, Lord, that this lesson will enlighten us and help us understand how to walk closer with you and how to do what you would have us do each day in our life. So we receive this lesson in thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. This fifth Sunday of Lent gospel reading continues with a reading where Jesus is identified as Messiah, again taking place around 28 AD. This week's reading from John's gospel, chapter 11, is the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead just before his triumphant entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. To show how close we are to the end of Jesus' ministry, this chart shows the four Gospels and their chapters as they are distributed throughout Jesus' ministry. Last week, we studied Chapter 9, Jesus Restoring Sight to the Blind Man. This week skips to Chapter 11. Except for the first 10 verses of Chapter 10 being one of the Gospels during the Easter season, most of the 10th chapter is not part of a gospel reading throughout the year. So a summary of chapter 10 shows Jesus continuing the confrontation he has with the temple leaders that started in chapter 9 after Jesus had restored sight to the man born blind. This is where he says, in order to see the kingdom of God, one must go through the narrow gate in order to gain entrance, and that he is the shepherd of that gate. He talks about himself as the good shepherd, willing to lay down his life for his sheep. He is referencing the fact that he will shortly go to the cross to do exactly that. The thing he talks about next, which infuriates the temple leaders and the crowd, is that he says he is doing the works of his father and that he and the father are one. Just as happened at the end of chapter 8, chapter 10 ends with a crowd picking up stones to throw at him. They even try to arrest him, but he escapes their hands. He then goes to the Jordan Valley away from Jerusalem. This Sunday's Gospel reading comes shortly after that confrontation. And Sunday's Gospel reading has an option of being all or some of verses 1 through 45 and the 11th chapter of John's Gospel. We will study the entire chapter. Verse 1. Now a man was ill, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfumed oil and dried his feet with her hair. It was her brother Lazarus who was ill. The sisters sent word to him, Jesus, saying, Master, the one you love is ill. When Jesus heard this, he said, This illness is not to end in death, but is for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he remained for two days in the place where he was. John's Gospel is built around three great miracles by Jesus. Chapter 5 tells of the healing of a paralytic at the pool of Bethesda. Chapter 9 the one that we read last week is opening the eyes of the man born blind, and now the raising of Lazarus from the dead. With each one, more people believe in him as the Messiah, and the opposition grows even stronger against him. This particular miracle is the greatest of all that Jesus performs. It also teaches us that God does not always do things the way that we want him to. On the map, we see Bethany only two miles away from Jerusalem, 
And remember, Jesus went to the Jordan Valley after the confrontation with the Jewish people at the end of chapter 10, and he is still there. In verse 2, Mary, being the one who had anointed the Lord with perfumed oil, that event will actually occur in chapter 12 of John's Gospel. This is also the Mary who wants to hear what Jesus teaches and Martha who wants to keep house in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42, while Jesus was in Judea during the Feast of Tabernacles. In verse 4, when Jesus says that this illness of Lazarus is not to end in death, we should take him at his word. Our faith must be in his word, regardless of what is seen and needs to be believed. Now, just as we saw in last week's study, where the translation was written so that it sounded inconsistent with what we have studied is in the way uh, Jesus does his work, is the same thing that's going to happen this week. Here in verse 4, the word but could also be translated nevertheless. That Greek word also means nevertheless. And the word is right next to it, is not in the original Greek manuscript. Now, we know that God is going to use this for his glory. But as we've asked in the past, is God the author of sickness and disease? As we saw last week with a man born blind, John 10.10, we read that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 says, He... The Messiah, as Isaiah prophesied, was has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. So verse 4 could be read. When Jesus heard this, he said, this illness is not to end in death. Nevertheless, for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Then in verse 6, where it says, so when he heard that he was ill, he remained for two days. It sounds like well, he's ill, so I'm going to stand, sit here for two days and just wait. So it almost sounds like he's being cruel. He's not going to go to him to do anything for him. He's just going to wait two more days. Well, he has a purpose for waiting, and we're going to see that in just a minute. Jesus still be, being at the Jordan. When the news arrives, he decides to wait two days before he goes to Judea. Why did he wait? Jesus knew that what he was going to do that they had to be assured that Lazarus was dead. It took two days for the messenger to get to Jesus. Jesus waits two days and takes two days to get to Judea so that Lazarus will be in the tomb for four days when Jesus arrives. Lazarus dies while Jesus is waiting two days at the Jordan Valley. Verse 7. And after this, he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just trying to stone you, and you want to go back there? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If one walks during the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks at night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. So verses 7 and 8 reflects the fact they just left Judea, and now Jesus wants to go back. Jesus' enemies waiting there to seeking to kill him. So not only does Jesus delay responding to those he loves, but now he confounds the disciples by doing something they do not expect. This shows Jesus is orchestrating the events of his life, praising Lazarus and his death going back. So he did not go to the Jordan out of fear of death although the disciples were most likely very relieved when he did go to the Jordan. The hour of his death needed to be at the first spring feast, Passover. So Jesus has to wait for that period. In verses 9 and 10, he's answering about, are there not 12 hours in the day? If one walks during the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if one walks at night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Commentaries believe this is a contemporary aphorism that the disciples would know. There are, there are 12 daylight hours to get your work done, or in this case, Jesus is using it 
to point out that he has a given amount of time to get his work done. Or it may refer to God's timing. If you try to do things out of his timing, you will fail. Or another interpretation is it may be he is foretelling the lack of faith that they'll be showing when they go to Bethany and accept Lazarus's death rather than believing Jesus' word. We've read in the past several passages that promise a long life. We're not doing his will or believing his word. We can live a shorter life, but it is not his will that we do so because his will is his word. Verse 11. He said this and then told them, Our friend Lazarus is asleep, but I'm going to awaken him. So the disciples said to him, Master, if he's asleep, he'll be saved. But Jesus was talking about his death while they thought that he meant ordinary sleep. So then Jesus said to them clearly, Lazarus has died. And I am glad for you that I was not there, that you may believe. Let us go to him. So Thomas, called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go to die with him. Why did Jesus tell his disciples Lazarus is asleep? Because he cannot bring himself to say he has died. Earlier, he said the sickness was not, would not lead to death. He also knew the power of words. That in Romans chapter 4, verse 17, that Paul writes, God calls those things which do not exist as though they did. And his letter in 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. And Corinthians 4, 18 says, Because we look not at what can be seen, but what cannot be seen. But what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. Jesus know that words are spiritual containers. So Jesus does not want to say with his words that Lazarus is dead. But he finally is forced to, just to make it clear to the disciples. So in verse 14, he finally has to come right out and tell them, because they didn't understand, has to tell them outright that Lazarus has died. So then in verse 15, when he says it will help them believe, so let's go to him. He's saying, since they still don't get it, Jesus knows what he's about to do will help their faith and belief in him. Now, being called Didymus is the Greek word for twin. Thomas is also called Didymus. Thomas begins to share his doubts, declaring what he expects to happen. Meanwhile, Jesus is proving what Isaiah 55, 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. So here we're talking about God's timing. And when the solution we're looking for through prayer does not occur when we wish it would, we need to be patient. God knows what to do, and we must trust him. Raising of Lazarus will be in three parts. First, dealing with Martha then dealing with Mary, and then dealing with Lazarus. So we move to verse 17. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, only about two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary sat at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So as I said, the Jews believed the spirit stayed with the body for three days. So if Jesus had raised Lazarus sooner, they would have doubted he actually was gone. We use the expression gone, but the body is there while the spirit, the real person, is gone. Verse 19 shows us that they were a very well-known family, as many mourners had come. Verse 21, where Martha says, if you'd been here, he, my brother would not have died. This is a typical response for those who saw what Jesus could do. You should have been here. She is not speaking reproachfully, but more regretfully. 
We do the same thing. We regret that God is not present to get us out of our dilemmas. But he is present. He is always present. So we have to keep that in mind, even when things don't occur like we would like them to. And in verse 22, did Martha expect Jesus to raise Lazarus? Even more importantly, she's expressing the fact that she knows what Jesus can do, and so putting her trust in him. And that's what we need to do when we pray, putting our trust in the Lord that when we pray and believe that it will happen. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. Martha said to him, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. So here when Jesus says, your brother will rise, he's still dead. Here Jesus is speaking of things that are not as though they were. Even though she knows from verse 22 that he can do anything, she does not connect what he is saying to what is going to occur. We should expect God to do things in a miraculous way and that when he does, we should not preconceive how that might occur. On verse 24, Martha says, I know he will rise in the last day in the resurrection. Martha is saying that she did not believe Jesus would raise Lazarus from the dead. She is most likely looking for comfort and peace from him, not that he, what he was about to do. We do the same thing, thinking the days of miracles are over and then expect less than what God can deliver. Verse 25, the famous words. Here the Greek is very strong in getting across the point. Literally, the phrase reads, he who lives will never, ever die forever. As a result, there is no sting in death. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians 1555, Paul writes, death, where is your sting? There is no sting in our physical death. The only way to eternal life, he says twice, is he who believes in me. Then in verse 27, she said, yes, I believe that you are the Christ. Martha responds in great faith now and belief that Jesus is the Messiah. She believes three things. He is the Messiah come to deliver us. He is God on the earth, and he's also the one who the prophets predicted would deliver the world. But she does not say she believes that Jesus will raise her brother from the dead. So then to verse 28, when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary secretly, saying, The teacher is here and is asking for you. As soon as she heard this, she rose quickly and went to him. For Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still where Martha had met him. So when the Jews who were with her in the house comforting her saw Mary get up quickly and go out, they followed her, presuming that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Here's a scene of much anguish. A beloved brother, a beloved friend of the family is being mourned. And in verse 32, Mary says the same thing that Martha did. If you only had been here, my brother would not have died. So once again, even though they know Jesus can do miracles, they're not believing that Lazarus is going to be raised from the dead. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he became perturbed and deeply troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said to him, sir, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind man have done something so that this man would not have died? So here we see Jesus is overcome 
by the grief being expressed. Martha was more stoic. Mary was grief stricken. In verse 33, the English translation here fails to translate the deeper meaning that these words represent. When it says he is perturbed, other translations say he groaned. The Greek word is embryomyomai. It includes a sense of anger or indignation because of the hurt and pain that has been caused by Satan. God is life and victory. This is hurt and pain that Satan causes. So in verse 35, Jesus wept. Now he knows he's on his way to raise Lazarus. So why does he weep? Is it because he is sharing their grief, sorrow, and heartache? Although Jesus knows they will shortly re be, be rejoicing, he does not say stop grieving. He shares their grief because at the time their grief is real. That's one way to interpret it. Or it might be interpreted from God's perspective and being God himself, Jesus is angry and weeps because of their lack of knowledge about him and their unbelief, their failure to have faith in the knowledge of him having the power to raise Lazarus from the dead. So that is a shortcoming we also have when we want to pray for something but we're not sure, sure that God can deliver it. Well, we have scriptures that deal with that. First one is from the Old Testament, Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. This means not the lack of knowledge of medicine or science. The secular world has all of that. This is lack of knowledge of his word and his promises. We just read in verses 9 and 10, Jesus says, if one walks during the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks at night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. We can either walk in darkness or in light. If they knew and believe the scriptures that they have out of the Old Testament, that since Lazarus was a young man, that they should not accept his death because he had been promised long life. They had the same Old Testament that we do to study and believe the promises of God. So here are some promises that we need to hang on and believe that God's word is true. The promise of long life in Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. Psalm 90, 10. The days of our life are 70 years or perhaps 80 if we are strong. Psalm 91, 14 through 16. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. So this one, particularly Psalm 91, not only does it promise long life, but we will be protected because we know his name. We can call on him, knowing that he will deliver us from trouble. He will rescue us whenever we are in trouble. If they and we do not know what he says and believe what he says, we can live a shorter life, but it's not his will that we do so, because his will is his word. He already told them in verse 4 that Lazarus' illness was not to end in death. Why didn't they believe him? If they believed him, they should have believed the way Abraham did. We are told about Abraham's belief in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when put to the test, offered up Isaac. He who had received the promises was ready to offer up his only son, of whom he had been told, it is through Isaac that descendants shall be named for you. He considered the fact that God is able even to raise someone from the dead. So what is the promise? Well, here the promise is to Abraham. It is through Isaac that descendants shall be named for you. So if he believes in the promise, then he knows his son Isaac must live to the age to bear children. We study the scriptures that say we have the mind of Christ. And how do we get the mind of Christ? How do we know what his ways are? as opposed to our ways, by knowing what he says, 
by believing what he says and doing what he says. The Bible is his word. It's the instruction manual for how he wants us to live just as an automobile operator's manual is for how to operate your car. More promises that we need to stand in faith for. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Mark eleven twenty four. 24, so I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. What are the promises? 15, 7, it will be done for you. 11, 24, it will be yours. Those are the promises that God gives if we believe. Jesus has told us that we must live, we must abide in him, and that he will then live in us. In John 10, 10, as we've referred to many times, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. What is the promise? We may have life and have it abundantly. Three things we must do to have the mind of Christ and live the abundant life Jesus died for us to enjoy. Number one is to know what he says. Second, believe what he says. And third, do what he says. We must appropriate his word, not just in our mind, but also believe it in our heart and then do it. Requires faith. We must believe the promises through faith. Faith is an active belief in your spirit that enables the promises to be manifested. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians 4.18, he writes, because we look not at what can be seen, but what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. Then later in his letter to the Corinthians 5.7, he writes, we walk by faith, not by sight. And then letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Then to verse 38. So Jesus, perturbed again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay across it. Jesus said, take the stone away. Martha, the dead man's sister, said to him, Lord, by now there will be a stench. He's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So verse 38, he still has this perturbed sense about him. He has the sense of anger and indignation that that word means. And verse 39 through 40, Martha still shows her lack of understanding with this comment. And Jesus responds, remember what I said. Didn't I tell you? Well, what Jesus tells us, what Jesus says, we need to remember and believe. In verse 41. So they took away the stone and Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd here, I have said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, tied hand and foot with burial bands, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. So Jesus said to them, untie him and let him go. So here in verse 41, 42, Jesus is thanking his father as if what he had asked for had already been done. He's just doing what he said to do when you pray in Mark 11, 24. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Verse 43, he cries out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. He cries it out in a loud voice so that everyone could hear it. He names Lazarus specifically because if he didn't, all the dead that could hear his voice would have come forth. Earlier in John's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 28, Jesus actually said, The hour is coming when all they that are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of Man and shall come forth. So he's talking about when he returns. And then in verse 44, Lazarus was prepared for burial in the tradition of the time with his face wrapped in a cloth, as it says. This is also the way Jesus was buried. 
because when the disciples go to the empty tomb, they see the linen wrappings and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head as separate items. That's in John 20, verses 6 and 7. So this would then discount the authenticity of the Shroud of Turin, because the Shroud of Turin is one single large cloth. Verse 45. Now, many of the Jews who had come to Mary and seen what he had done began to believe in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what he had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the council and said, what are we to do? This man is performing many signs. We let him go on like this. Everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. Now, what these verses help us do is answer the age-old question, do we have free will or are our life's events predestined? Here, some believed in Jesus, but then some didn't and went to the Pharisees and told them what had been done. So apparently, they didn't believe who he had said he was. The story in Luke 16, 23 through 31 gives us insight into our ability to choose. That's the story of the rich man going to hell and seeing a beggar named Lazarus. It's not the same Lazarus here in this gospel reading. Seeing Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. The rich man tells Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his five, five brothers so that they, in turn, would not go to hell because he had. Abraham responds, quote, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear him. If they do not hear listen to and follow what Moses and the prophets said, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead, as verse 31 says in Luke chapter 16. So these people responding to what they just saw happen, raising of Lazarus from the dead, did this without coercion. They either chose to believe in Jesus or they chose not to, and they basically went and told on him. The Old Testament gives us options to choose. We've studied in the past Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 14, where we see a listing of the blessings that will come on those who follow God's word. And then verses 15 through 68 are the curses that will come upon those who don't follow his commands. Then finally, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. So we do have a choice. Everyone is free to choose, and everyone will face the inevitable consequences of their choice. So in these verses here, we see the response of the Sanhedrin, the council of the uh, temple. They gathered and things are getting out of hand, so they decide action must be taken. So then in verse 49, which is not the gospel reading, gospel reading then ends at verse 48, but continuing with a commentary in the gospel. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. You don't understand that it's better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. He did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but to gather into one the dispersed children of God. So from that day on, they planned to put him to death. So we have John recording this event, the raising of Lazarus from the dead, from three perspectives. The first two are the human worldly views and are fatally incorrect. The third is God's view and results in redemption. The first one, the Pharisees, they're the strict law abiders, their view. If Jesus is the Messiah, he will attempt to overthrow the Romans and the wrath of Rome will come down on them and destroy the temple and nation Israel. They forgot the sovereignty of Israel was preserved by God, not their clever political manipulations. When they kill the Messiah, God's protection is removed. The temple destroyed and the Jews are scattered. Consequently, by killing Jesus, everything 
they feared actually occurred. The Sadducees, on the other hand, they are the um, temple leaders who do not believe in resurrection and they compromised with Rome. Their, here's their view. Verse 49, it says, Caiaphas, a Sadducee, is high priest. And, and as we know from historical records that he bought the job as the Romans made the appointment to the highest bidder, he offers the way the mafia answers to how to fix the problem. Kill the one who's the problem and save the organization. Then the third view is God's view. Verse 51, Caiaphas is confirming the prophecy of Isaiah that we have here, chapter 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is also confirmation that God's plan will be carried out no matter what man does or how man interprets things. Caiaphas misunderstands prophecy, but he unwittingly does confirm it. If he had the wisdom God bestows, he would have approached it differently, as recorded by Paul in 1 Corinthians verses 2, verses 7 and 8. But we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Then the chapter ends at verse 54. Jesus therefore no longer walked about openly among the Jews, but went from there to a town called Ephraim in the region near the wilderness, and he remained there with his disciples. So then the fourth and final view of these events John gives us is that of the one who is in control of the events since his time had not yet come. So Jesus goes to Ephraim, as we see a distance away from Jerusalem, waiting until it is time to go to Jerusalem for the last time. Now we move to the first reading. Go back to the Old Testament to the prophet Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel is considered a major prophet due to the length of his book in the scripture. Ezekiel was both a prophet and a priest. 48 chapters long, his prophecies are very important in connecting the Old Testament with the New. He prophesies about things that are written in the book of Revelation. We'll see some of this when we look at the first part of chapter 37, where the first reading is taken. God has given Ezekiel the task of telling the Jewish people in Judah that due to their refusal to honor and worship the one true God, that they will be exiled and the city destroyed, just as the northern kingdom of Israel had been. Zooming into this section, you can see the time bar of Ezekiel's prophetic ministry starting before the destruction of Jerusalem and continues until after the remaining exiles are taken from Jerusalem to Babylon. Not only did he serve in the temple, but when the Babylonians came to destroy the temple, in chapter 8, verse 6 of the book of Ezekiel, God says to Ezekiel, Do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel are committing here to drive me far from my sanctuary? Now, as the situation deteriorates later, Ezekiel actually sees the thick cloud leave which dwelt in the temple and represented God. And in chapter 10, verse 18 of Ezekiel, it says, Then the glory of the Lord went out from the threshold of the house. God basically was vacating the premises. God abandons the temple and the city before it is destroyed. Now, when he gives this prophecy, from chapter 37. He's already in Babylon. God shows him this vision. These prophecies were delivered in the year 586 BC, very important year in the history of the Jewish people. 586 BC was when we see here the remainder of the exiles were taken from Judah to Babylon. Just before this takes place is when the content of the first reading this Sunday is delivered as a prophecy. We'll start at verse 1 and see as it leads up to the first reading. The hand of the Lord came upon me, 
And he led me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me in the center of the plain, which was now filled with bones. He made me walk among the bones in every direction so that I saw how many they were on the surface of the plain, how dry they were. He asked me, son of man, can these bones come to life? I answered, Lord God, you alone know that. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, see, I will bring spirit into you that you may come to life. I will put sinews upon you, make flesh grow over you, cover you with skin and put spirit in you so that you may come to life and know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded. And as I prophesied, there suddenly was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I saw the sinews and the flesh come upon them and the skin cover them, but there was no spirit in them. Then the Lord said to me, prophesy to the spirit, prophesy, son of man, and say to the spirit, thus says the Lord God, from the four winds come, O spirit, and breathe into these slain that they may come to life. I prophesied as he told me, and the spirit came into them. They came alive and stood upright, a vast army. Now, in these first 10 verses of chapter 37, there are significant relationships to other verses in Scripture, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So notice in verses 5 through 10, verse 5 is the word spirit, verse 6 is the word spirit, verse 8, the word spirit, and verses 9 through 10, five more to- four more times the word spirit and one time the word winds. In these five verses, the words spirit and winds are all the same Hebrew word, ruah. Other translations say breath instead of spirit. The different translations shows us the deeper meaning of the Hebrew word ruah that implies breath as we know the term and spirit as we also understand the term. In every case, It is a noun, the actual existence of the spirit or breath that exists that will be put into these bones. In the New Testament, where it shows the English word spirit, it's translated from the Greek word pneuma, which also has the same deeper meaning of wind or breath. It's the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew word ruah in the Old Testament. So the spirit here in this reading is the same spirit that was received by the disciples on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended upon them. Now here, the word breathe in verse 9 is not the Hebrew word ruah. It's the Hebrew word napa. While spirit and wind are something that exists, the noun that's used throughout these verses, This Hebrew word, napa, is a verb where the Spirit of God is breathed into the bones. The word literally means to blow. And it's the same Hebrew word used in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, that says, God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils. This then leads us to Sunday's first reading, starting at verse 11. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They've been saying, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, and we are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, O my people, I will open your graves and have you rise from them and bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and have you rise from them, O my people, I will put my spirit in you that you may live, and I will settle you upon your land. Thus you shall know that I am the Lord. I have promised, and I will do it, says the Lord. So did you get that at the end there? Whenever he promises, he will do what he promises. 
So while Jerusalem is being destroyed, God is promising through Ezekiel's prophecy here that the dried up, hopeless, cut off nation of Israel will be restored in the future. This prophecy, however, has a double meaning. The first meaning is that of the dried up, hopeless, cut off nation of Israel that is being destroyed and goes into exile, that it will be resurrected. Seemingly dead, they will be brought out of the grave of exile and restored to the promised land. This will happen 70 years after being exiled. The temple will be rebuilt, the Holy of Holies restored, and God will once again be in the tabernacle until Jesus is crucified 600 years later and the curtain in the temple is torn in two when Jesus, as the final Passover sacrifice, opens the way for those who believe in him to receive the Spirit of God. The second meaning of the prophecy, verses 12, I will open your graves and have you rise from them, bring you back to the land of Israel. You shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves. Have you rise from them? I will put my spirit in you that you may live. I will settle you upon your land. The second meaning is that verses 12 through 14 clearly refers to the future when Jesus, the Messiah, returns and the dried up, hopeless, and cut off world that we live in today sees the graves opened up and our spirits restored to our bodies, just as the resurrected bones were witnessed by Ezekiel here in these verses. The new heaven and the new earth then becomes the place for all of eternity, where God dwells with his people and Jesus is our king. Now we go to the second reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Paul writes this letter to the church sometime between 55 and 60 AD. As we have said when studying Romans in the past, this is one of Paul's most significant letters, especially for us Christians. Paul presents the fundamental principles of what living as a Christian is all about. In chapter 7, verse 23, Paul tells us about the battle that every human faces, the struggle to obey the law in obedience to God. But then he says we cannot. It's impossible. This is called legalism. The church has millions of believers who are trying to please God through legalism. They will continue to be condemned of sin by trying to obey the law, but they will never succeed. Paul tells us this struggle does not need to go on. The first sentence in chapter 7, verse 25, expresses Paul's relief that we need not struggle. So when we get to chapter 8, where the second reading for this Sunday comes from, tells us why we need not struggle. Verse one, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So the first verse shows us that no one can condemn you as long as you know you are walking in Christ. This also tells us there is relief from legalism, walking in the Spirit. And it also proves there is still a struggle between the sinful nature of Adam and the spirit, even after we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and it is between our flesh and our spirit. It is access to our humanity that Satan has, where he implants thoughts in our minds to do evil. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16 says, these are the fiery darts of the devil. In Galatians 5, 17, Paul describes this struggle further. He says, for the sinful nature, the flesh, desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. So what is it we do that we don't want to do? 
Well, it's the grip of alcoholism, homosexuality, overeating, whatever it is we do that we don't want to do. And these are manifested by us willfully doing with our body the things that Satan puts in our minds. It can be resolved and resisted, but only through the spirit. I always thought the older cartoons that showed a decision to be made by who the cartoon character was, and they show the devil on one side and an angel on the other side talking to the character, in this case, Fred, Fred Flintstone, on what he should do. And this is always the way I thought it was, and it, and it's, it's, it's how it works. It goes in our mind. We struggle from one side to the other. It's a struggle of the will not to re-engage in sinful habits and behaviors that we had before coming to Christ. This struggle can only be remedied when we recognize that we do not have the power to resist. It's only the Holy Spirit that we are able to do so. That's why three times in the Gospel of John, chapter 14 and chapter 15 and chapter 16, Jesus speaking to his disciples called the Holy Spirit the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name in chapter 14. The word comforter in John 14, 26 is the Greek word parakletos. And where in this translation it uses the word comforter, it is also translated companion, counselor, advocate, helper. So here again, here's a deeper meaning that the Greek word has that a single English word does not adequately reflect. It's all of these words that the comforter means and that the Holy Spirit is. So just as people have a personal trainer for their physical body, we have to understand that the Holy Spirit is our spiritual personal assistant. We can only appropriate this power if we know that we are in Christ, not just a sinner saved by grace, but a born again creation, so that the just requirement, as Paul writes here in verse 4, the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, that is displayed as we walk in the Spirit, so that the things we do by following the Holy Spirit are manifestations of our righteousness. This is sanctification. This should be our new behavior, replacing those things we did with our physical being that are sinful with the things that we should be doing because we walk in Christ. So as it says at the end, we walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And he continues the thought in verse five, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. So this idea in verse 5, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, Everybody wants to attain a level of self-worth or righteousness in front of others. We try to attain it by being approved by others, doing things that are recognized by others, and thus giving us this sense of value in front of them. But we have to keep doing it over and over. It's, it's like a football coach has to do. They're only measured by how many wins that they have now. This way of finding self-worth is inadequate. It lets you down. True righteousness can only be attained as a gift from God. So does God not want us to have, make money, to have fun, to gain recognition, to be fulfilled? All would say, God forbid. The secular world lives for these things. There are things that we do want too, and we don't ignore these things and become so spiritually minded that we are of no earthly good, but we can have them the way God wants us to have them. By living according to the Spirit, we can pursue these things in an attitude of love, helping others, speaking truth, and loving God, seeking his glory, not ours. As it says, doing it uh, the secular world's way is death. But it's death in the Spirit. 
God's way is life and peace. We're to have our mind geared toward things of the spirit because the mind set on the flesh is hostile or at opposition to God, as verse 7 says. And when we get to verse 8, it will tell us that it cannot please him. But before we get to verse 8, let's look at some implications here. When someone's life is focused on money, fun, fame, fulfillment, as the secular world does, then death is occurring. Death is not something that just happens when your body dies. This mindset, having your mindset on the flesh, manifests in this life in these ways. Fear, worry, anxiety, and dread come upon you. You feel guilt, shame, self-loathing, self-righteousness, perfectionism. You feel hostility. You have hate, resentment, bitterness, revenge, cruelty. And you face emptiness, a lonely, depressed, discouraged, despair, meaninglessness. So verse 8 tells us, Brothers and sisters, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh. You're in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So if death is represented by the four things we just listed, fear, guilt, hostility, and emptiness, then life is represented just the opposite of those four things. The opposite of fear is faith. We have trust, hope, and confidence. 2 Timothy 1.17 says, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. The opposite of guilt is forgiveness, feeling of acceptance, security, and assurance. The opposite of hostility is love. Friendliness, kindness, reaching out to others is expressed. Then the opposite of emptiness is fulfillment. Sense of well-being, excitement, vitality, full of life. Then the reading continues. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit dwelling in you. So the reading Sunday ends at verse 11. I want to do these next two verses too. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Even though our body may be dead to sin, meaning we are no longer in the flesh, we cannot choose to live according to the flesh. So in verse 11, it's the Holy Spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus that lives in us. Even our mortal bodies will be given life through his spirit that lives in you, ultimately to become a resurrected, glorified body, just as Jesus is today. Our bodies cannot avoid ultimate death, physical death, because they are not yet redeemed. They must be resurrected. So even though our spirit is redeemed, our bodies are not yet. So then in verse 12, that's also why we can still live according to the flesh, since our will still has the option to choose that life and can entertain bitterness and strife and hatred and resentment. Those who have not accepted Christ can only live in that realm. They don't have the life the spirit provides. For Christians, even though we will be severely tempted to sin, we have the power in us to say no. First letter of John 4.4 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. What keeps the Holy Spirit close to us? The gift of righteousness. This is further expressed in earlier in Paul's letter to the Romans chapter 6. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God 
as instruments of righteousness. So this is a life lived sanctified, an example of the behavior Christ would have us demonstrate. So this reading, once again, supports the idea of us having a choice. We can choose to do what our bodies want to do, or we can choose not to, but we have something to help us overcome those things that our body wants to do. We have the Holy Spirit with us to help us overcome the temptations of what our body wants to do, or what Satan's trying to tell us we should do. So we have the three readings this coming Sunday, John chapter 11, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Once again, an example of Jesus being recognized as the Messiah, as we've had every reading, every gospel reading during Lent, progressively show us from story to story where Jesus is recognized as the Messiah. Then in the first reading from Ezekiel chapter 37, we have the bones coming together and God bringing them to life. And that then being an example of not only the restoration of the Jewish people to their homeland at the time that Ezekiel was exiled in uh, Babylon, but also a prophecy for us in the future that we will be restored to life and live in the eternal kingdom of the new heaven and the new earth. Then we have Paul's letter to the Romans chapter eight, where he gives us an illustration and an explanation of how important it is to be able to live the life in Christ and live the life in our spirit connected with Christ so that we can overcome the things that Satan is trying to have us do. Coming out of the darkness and living in the glorious light of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the richness of these readings this coming Sunday, the richness of these lessons, the ability for us to be able to overcome the world by living in our spirit with you, trusting in you, trusting that the Holy Spirit is our comforter, is our counselor, is our director in helping us to overcome what Satan would try to get us to do through our bodies, through our flesh, and being able to live above those things and live in fulfillment of what your word tells us we should do so that we can live in righteousness with you. So we thank you for these lessons. We thank you also that we can absorb them in our spirits and in our minds and allow us to be able to share them with others who also need them in their lives as well. So we thank you for these lessons. Receive them in thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.